All right, so Caitlin said, mm, don't really like the remainder theorem. Do you have to use it on all the problems? And the answer to that is no, not on all of them. You just need to get used to it and know how it works. Um, so basically, what the what this what was the theorem again? Yeah, a, a mathematical law or something like that. It's it's a, a mathematical idea that's been proven to be true. Okay, so we're working with polynomials. If we divide it, then the remainder is the same as the function value. Okay, so we went through and we did a couple of examples where we did division. And then we plugged that point into it. So on this one right here, we plugged 3 in. We used uh, synthetic division with a 3, and we plugged in a 3, and we came up with the same thing on each one. Okay. So the rem remainder theorem does work. It just gives us a different way um, to figure out whether or not we've got a factor. Okay. So uh, let's pick up right here. The remainder theorem gives us two ways to determine if x minus c is a factor. So when you were working with this yesterday, and when we just corrected 5.1, when we're doing synthetic division, if we find out that the remainder is zero, then we know it went in evenly, then we know it was a factor, right? Well, this just gives us a different way to figure that out, okay? So we can divide by x minus, to c, uh, x minus c to see if the remainder is zero. If the remainder is zero, and then we know it had to be a factor. Or we can plug it in to see if f of c is zero, okay? So you can either plug it into the function into the polynomial to see if it equals zero, or you can do synthetic division. Now, in practice, we don't do this very often. We don't plug it in. We usually do division, and you'll see why, because we're going to be factoring a bunch of long polynomials. Okay? So the next thing is the factor theorem. Okay? And what the factor theorem does is it helps us understand how factors, zeros, and x-intercepts are related. Now, don't make things more complicated than they have to be. You already kind of understand this theorem. Okay? So this is called the factor theorem. And what it says is, if f of c is 0, then x minus c is a factor of f. So again, we're working with polynomials. If you plug in that point and you get a 0, that means it's on the x-axis. If that point is on the x-axis, then x minus that point would be a factor. Okay? And if it's a factor, then the function value would have to equal 0 there. Okay? So it goes both ways. Okay, so what this means is we can use the zeros to find the factors, and we can use the factors to find the zeros. Okay, and remember, we use the word zeros and x-intercepts and solutions and roots. Those are kind of all interchangeable, okay? Okay, so I'm going to leave that right there so we can still see that factor theorem. And then we're going to take a look at this. So here's a picture of a polynomial. Now, we spent a lot of time graphing polynomials in Chapter 4. That would be pretty easy to graph, wouldn't it? Okay, what is this x-intercept right there? Negative 2. What's this one right here? Positive 1. And what's this one right here? Positive 4. Okay. The way those became x-intercepts is they have to correspond to a factor. So this chapter is kind of like what we did in the last chapter, but in reverse. So if I know this was a 0, negative 2, 1, and 4, what factor would they correspond to? So this, what would this one be, Emily? This one would have been x plus 2. So remember in the last chapter that most of them were already factored. Okay, even if they were big, long, ugly polynomials, they were already factored. And we could just look at it and figure out what the zero was. Okay? So on this, we're doing that a little bit in reverse. We're taking the zeros and coming up with the factors, or we're going to have to factor the polynomial just from the very start. So if, the x, if negative 2 is a zero, then x plus 2 is a factor. Or really, the way this rule works is, if that's a zero, then x minus c is a factor. So the c, or the 0 in this case, is negative 2. So x minus minus 2, that's why it's x plus 2. Does that make sense? So what's the factor that corresponds to this 0? Wow, everybody there. And this one? x minus 4, that's it. Okay? So find the x-intercepts on the graph. That's easy. We just looked at it, and we can figure out what they are. State the factor that would have produced each x-intercept. OK, 
Okay, so if we've got negative two, the factor it would have come from would have had something to do with x plus two. For one, it would have been x minus one. For four, it would have been x minus four. And the last one says, find a polynomial that could produce the graph. Find a polynomial that could produce the graph. Well, this isn't a polynomial yet. What do we need to do with this in order to make a polynomial? Yeah, multiply them all together. So let's multiply these first two together right here. So when I do that, I'm going to get, well, let's see, that's going to be x squared plus x minus 2. Is that okay? x times x is x squared, 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. This would make, make a 2x, this would make a minus 1x, so the middle term is just 1x, positive 1x. Everybody good there? And then we'd have to distribute through again. So I'm going to multiply here. So that's going to give me, let's see, x cubed plus x squared minus 2x, and then I'll multiply the negative 4 through. So that's going to be negative 4x squared minus 4x, and that's going to be a plus 8, and then I collect all the like terms. So if I collect all the like terms, I've got an x cubed, got that one taken care of. For x squared, I've got a minus 3x squared. For the x's, I've got a minus 6x, and then I've got a plus 8. So that's the polynomial that could have produced that graph. That easy enough? Okay. Again, here are the answers. There are the zeros. Whoops. Try that again. There are the zeros. Okay. There are the factors. Okay. And there's the polynomial, polynomial that could have produced those zeros and those factors. Any questions there? Okay. Um, I do want to point out, you'll notice that this doesn't have a scale on the y-axis. Okay? We don't know where it crosses the y-axis. So this is one polynomial that could produce that. But if I put like a 7 in front of that, all that would do is it's not going to change anything about um, the x-intercepts. It's just going to change how steep portions of the graph are, and it would change where it crosses the x, or excuse me, the y-axis. Okay? So that's one answer. It's not the only answer. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Hopefully that seems pretty easy. Okay, use the factor theorem to determine whether the function, that ugly mess right there, has the following factors. Okay, again, let's look at that. Uh, it says there are two ways that you can do this, basically. If you plug the point in and you get zero, that means the remainder is zero. That means it must have been a factor. Okay, or you could do synthetic division if you want. Okay, doesn't matter. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this one this way. Um, what number would I plug into the function if I'm checking to see if x minus 1 is a factor? Positive 1, right? Well, that's pretty easy to plug in here because I just get, well, this would be a 2. This would be a minus 1. This would be a 2. And that would still be a minus 3. So I get 2 plus 2 is 4. 3 and 1 make 4. That would be a negative. So f of 1 is 0. So what? We're plugging in a positive one. Yeah, but, but like, uh, oh, no, it's one, one cube is still one. Yeah. And x squared is still one. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you, if you plug a one in there, it's still a one. If you plug in a one in there, it's still a one with a negative in front of it. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So is it a factor? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Will you check this one right here? Will you check uh, what number would we plug in here? Negative three. negative three. So we're going to check and see if f of negative three. What do we hope the answer is? Zero. We hope the answer is zero. This one's a little harder because you do have to plug it in and figure out what you get when you cube it, square it, times it by 2 or whatever. As usual, we'd want, we'd want to plug things in in parentheses. Negative 3 cubed is negative 27. 
Is this one going to be positive or negative? Yeah. Okay, so there's one negative here, two here, so this is going to be a minus 9. That's a minus 6, and that's going to be a minus 3. Okay, let's, let's take a good look here. Is there any way this is going to be 0? Nope. Because this is going to be negative 54, and then we're just going to continue subtracting. So the answer to this is negative. So is that a factor? No. Nope. Okay. All right. Any questions there? Okay. I do want to show you one quick thing. Um, I'm not a huge fan of plugging these in to see whether or not it's a zero. I kind of like synthetic division. It's a little easier to keep track of, especially when you've got a number like this, because then you don't have to worry about squaring things or cubing things. And if you're careful, okay, and it looks like most people did well on uh, section 5.1, it, it usually is easier. You're less inclined to make mistakes, and there's another huge advantage. So let's take a look at this. If I were to put 1 in the box and then write down, well, let's see, I'd have to write down a 2. Make sure I haven't skipped any powers. If I do this right, I better end up with a 0 here again. So this is going to be a 2. This is going to be a 2. This is going to be a 1. This is going to be a 1. That's going to be a 3. And then I end up with a 3 here and then a 0. So that goes in evenly. That means the factor that it corresponds to, again, was x minus 1. Okay, and what this means is, what's left here is, again, does anybody remember what the name of this was? Okay, it was the quotient. It's also the depressed polynomial. Okay, so you end up with this little guy right here, which is a quadratic, which we could then work with. Okay, so I kind of like that synthetic division a little bit better. Okay, all right. A couple other theorems that we need to go over that will help us find the zeros of a polynomial. Okay. So the next one, and this one's really easy, this is just the number of uh, real zeros. A polynomial function cannot have more real zeros than its degree. It's that simple. So what degree is this? Three. How many real zeros can it have? Up to three. It can have up to three real zeros. Okay, what degree is this? Six. How many real zeros can it have? Up to 6. Now, does it have to have 6? No. Okay. And this one right here? Okay. Up to 1. Okay. And in fact, this one would have to have 1. Okay. If it's a degree 1, that means it's a line. It's going to start down here and end up here. Is there any way a graph can start below the x-axis, end up above the x-axis, and not have at least one x-intercept? It's not possible. Okay. So if you've got a degree 1 polynomial, what you've got is a line, okay, and it's going to cross the x-axis. Okay, any questions there? Okay, so it's that simple. All that does is just tell us how many zeros we're looking for, okay? So on this one, if I find three, I wouldn't keep looking for more of them because I know there's only three, okay? Can't have any more than that. Does that make sense? Okay, pretty easy, right? Okay, now let's look at this one. This is an interesting one. Okay, this is called the Rational Zeros Theorem, okay? I think yesterday at the beginning of class I asked you, what's a rational number? It's a fraction, okay? Now, fractions are generally not our favorite, okay? But some of them are nice numbers. Like some rational numbers, we gave some examples yesterday. Like, is 5 a rational number? 5 is a rational number because you can write it as 5 over 1, right? Okay? Negative 3 is a rational number, okay? Is 0 a rational number? Yep. Zero on top, one on the bottom, okay? So, um, the idea here is, so let's take a look at this. It says we're working with a polynomial function of degree one or higher, so it looks like this ugly mess. This expression right here is just a way of saying we're working with a polynomial. So this is a sub n, that's how you say that, x to the n, so that's just like a power function with a coefficient in front. Another power function that's one degree less, with a coefficient in front, and then two less and three less and, and so forth until we get down to an x to the first. And this one at the end is just a constant. Okay, so all the a's, those are like coefficients or constants, and all the x to the n, x to the n minus one, those are all power functions. Okay, so this is just saying we've got a polynomial. All right, okay, and it says each coefficient is an integer. Okay, uh, 
if p over q is in lowest terms, it is a rational zero of f, then p must be a factor of a naught and q must be a factor of a sub n. Now, raise your hand if you understand that. Really? Okay. I, I, would, I would hope not. Okay, that's really wordy. Okay, we're going to try and make it really simple. Okay, whenever you hear rational zeros theorem, I want you to think this, P and Q stuff. Okay, that's how we're going to refer to it. Okay, it's actually not that hard to figure out. So we're going to talk about what this theorem means. Okay, so if we're going to find the zeros of a polynomial, Okay, let's say we had a choice of finding zeros like this and like this. So choice number one and choice number two. Which zero would you rather work with? Two plus radical three or three halves? Three halves. Okay, because it's a little bit easier. Okay, it's a little bit nicer. So we're going to refer to these as nice zeros. When you hear the word rational zeros theorem, we're going to be finding the nice zeros first, because if you'd rather work with three halves than two radical three or two plus radical three, okay? So we're going to find the nice ones first. And what the rational zeros theorem does is it helps us find the nice ones first, and then we can hopefully find the ugly ones at the end if we have to, okay? So um, go ahead and flip it over. We're on example five, and it says list the potential, where we could use this word possible rational zeros, okay? So list the possible nice zeros. So remember, if it says find the rational ones, okay, or list the possible ones, or uh, list, use the rational zeros theorem, we're going to think P and Q stuff. So here's how this works. That number is P and that number is Q. P is the constant at the end. Q is the coefficient at the beginning. Doesn't have anything to do with the x cubed. It's just the 2, just the coefficient. Okay? Now, we'll look at the theorem one more time just to kind of review here. It says Q must be a factor of a sub n. a sub n is right here at the beginning. That's why the Q goes up here. And let's see. P is a factor of a naught. a naught is the one at the end. So P is at the end, Q is at the beginning. Everybody good with that? Okay, so here's how it works. We're going to write down what P is. Now, you can write down negative 6 or positive 6. It doesn't matter. Okay, I'll show you why in just a second. And we're going to write down Q is 2. So we're going to write down factors of P, and we're going to write down factors of Q. So what numbers go into 6 evenly? What's the first one? Two. Even before 2. 1. 1 goes in, 2 goes in, 3 goes in, 6 goes in, right? What goes into 2? 1 and 2. Everybody good so far? Okay. Possible, rational, zeros. So we're going to make our list. The only way it can be a zero, a rational zero, is if it's a factor of P over a factor of Q. So we're going to take each one of these factors of P and we're going to put it over each factor of Q. So I'm going to take one and put it over one. I'm going to take two and put it over one. Three and put it over one. Six and put it over one. Now that's a little bit silly because what's each of those over one? It's just whatever the number was to begin with, right? Okay. And then let's take each one of these and put it over two. So we're going to do one over two, two over two, three over two, and six over two. Everybody good? Okay. Instead of writing one over one, what would I write? Let's just write one, comma, two, comma, three, comma, six, comma, one half. Okay, do I need to write one again? It's already in my list. Okay, so we're fine. Okay, three over two, six over two. Six over two is a three. So here's my list. I've got one, two, th one, two, three, six, 
one half and three halves. So I have six possible rational zeros. Everybody good with that? Okay, now notice it didn't say find them, it just said list them. Here's our list. Okay, now we're not quite done. We have to do one more thing, but it's really easy. Remember I said you can ignore the uh, six and the, or the negative in front of the six? Okay, I said you didn't really have to worry about that. Well, if it was a negative six, okay, or even if it's a positive six, it doesn't really matter. Does negative one go in there? Does negative one go evenly into six? Yeah, you could do negative six times uh, negative one. That would work. So what we do is we account for that by saying, you know what? Any one of these could be positive or negative. Any one of these could be positive or negative. So I put a plus or minus in front of each one of these. So I have a list of six numbers, but when I put plus or minus in front of these, I get, how many numbers do I have in this list now? Okay, I have 12. 12 possible rational zeros. Okay? You have some problems that are just like that. Okay, make sure you read the instructions. All they're asking you to do is just list the possible rational zeros. If there are any nice ones, we want to find the nice ones first. And if they're nice ones, they have to be in the form P over Q. So we figure out the factors of P, figure out the factors of Q, do these little division problems, and then make this list, put plus or minus in front of them, and that's it. Okay, it doesn't say you have to find which ones work. We'll do that in a minute. Okay. Any questions there? Okay, so let's take a quick look back here. Um, this one just tells us how many we're looking for. This theorem tells us if we're going to find them, let's find the nice ones first, and it tells us which ones we can use. Okay, so the last two theorems do not find the zeros of the polynomial force. All they do is they make finding zeros easier. Okay? All right, any questions? Okay, let's start doing some problems then. This is problem number two. It's very similar to one on your assignment. So here are the instructions. Please make sure you read the instructions for each different section here. It says use the remainder theorem to find uh, the remainder when f of x is divided by x minus c. Use the factor theorem to determine whether x minus c is a factor. Okay, now let's go back and look at the remainder theorem. Okay, that was where we just plugged it in to see if the function value equals zero. And the factor th theorem said if it did equal zero, then it was a factor. So these kind of work together. So let's do this problem. It says use the remainder theorem to find uh, the remainder. Use the factor theorem to determine whether x minus c is a factor. So we're going to take this number right here. And if you want to do synthetic division, fine. If you want to plug the number in, that's okay, too. So we could plug in. What number would we be plugging in? Negative 3. Okay. So we'd have negative 4, negative 3 cubed, 5, negative 3 squared, plus 8. So let's see, this is going to be positive. That's uh, 27 times 4, that's 108. That's going to be positive. 9 times 5, that's going to be 45. Is there any way this equals 0? Nope. So it's going to be like 161, I think. So that's the function value. That's the remainder. So is that a factor? No. Not a factor. If the function value isn't zero, the remainder is not zero, so it's not a factor. That simple. Okay, that's all you have to do. Okay, next one. List the potential rational zeros of this polynomial. Do not attempt to find the zeros. So if it says potential rational zeros, you think P and Q stuff. So we'll figure out what P is and figure out what Q is. Is P at the beginning or the end? 
It's at the end, so that's a six. What's Q? Okay, we can think of it as four or negative four. Remember, we're going to take care of the pluses and minuses at the end. Okay, so we're going to list the factors. One, two, three, and six. Factors of four? One, two, and four. So then we're going to take every one of the P's and put it over every one of the Q's. So our list is going to be, well, let's, let's see if we can make this a little bit easier. It's going to be each of these over one. Do I need to write them over one? No. So let's write one, two, three, and six. Okay, so we got the one taken care of. Okay, now let's do the next one. Let's do each one of them over two. So this is going to be one half. One over, or excuse me, two over two. Do I need to write that again? No. Nope. Three over two. I do need to write that. Six over two. I don't need to write that. Okay, so we got that one done. Okay, now we're on the four. One over four. Two over four. Already in my list. Already one half. Three over four. Yep, three over four. Six over four. Six over four is the same as three over two. It's already in my list. Okay, I'm almost done. I could put a big circle around this here and call it done except for one thing. What else do I have to do? Okay, plus or minus in front of each one of these. Okay, so this is a little bit on the tedious side, but is this very difficult? Okay. Okay, I want to talk about this. Everybody look up here. How many possible rational zeros did we just find? Eight numbers, plus or minus for each one of them. So 16 possible rational zeros. So if we're going to find any nice zeros, they've got to be on this list. Yeah. Isn't it supposed to be P over Q? Yeah. There's one half right there. Okay, but where do you start then? What do you mean? Where does the P start with the, I, okay. the P's over So the here, here are all the factors of P. Here are all the factors of Q. Good there? Yeah. One over one is one. Two over one is two. Three over three is three. Three over, three over one is three. Okay, so there's that. And then I did one over two. I, I get it. Good? Okay. Everybody good there? Okay. If there are any nice zeros, if there are any rational zeros, they have to be in this list. That's what that theorem says. Okay? Now, is there any way that all of them could work? All 16 of them. I see some shaking heads, no. Okay, why is there no way all 16 of these could work? John. Okay, what degree is this polynomial? Three. So how many zeros can it have? Up to three. It doesn't have to have three, but it can have up to three. So we can't have any more than three. So there's, there's no way all 16 of them could work. At most, three of these could work. Okay, what we hope is we find a couple easy ones and then finish it off with the quadratic formula or something like that. Okay? Any questions? So when you have a problem like this where it just says list them, is it that difficult? Not very hard at all, right? Okay. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, this one says, use the rational zeros theorem to find all the real zeros of that polynomial right there. Does that look like you can factor it? That looks like a mess. This is going to be the most difficult polynomial we factored, but after a little bit of practice, it turns out to be pretty easy. Now, if we were going to factor this, if we, were, if we were going to find zeros of this, we'd want to find the nice ones first, right? So let's make a list of the nice ones, and let's see which ones work, okay? So then it says, then use the zeros to factor it over the real numbers. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the P and Q stuff first. So what's P on this one? 20. And Q is 1. So the great thing about this is whenever Q is 1, what's the only factor for Q? One. Just 1. So this is going to be 1, 2, 
4, 5, 10, 20, right? Put all those over 1, it's still the same list. So I'm going to put plus or minus in front of each one of them. Okay. How many possible rational zeros? 12, right? Is there any way all of them can work? Okay. So take a look at this right here. Here's what this means. You always want to look at that uh, leading uh, term there, the highest degree. Okay. We are looking for up to three real zeros. Okay. Now you don't have to write that down on every one of them, but at least think about it. We want to find all three of them. Okay. We want to find if they're if all three of them are real. We want to find all of them. Okay. Now, if this is your list. Let's take a good look here. Which numbers do you want to check first? Do you want to check to see if 20 works or 5 works or should we check 1? Yeah, 1's a really easy number to plug in. Okay, now, for 1 and negative 1's, those are the only ones where I kind of like the remainder theorem where you actually plug it in. So watch. If I plug a 1 in here, what do I get? 8, 11, negative 20. Uh, let's see, that's 9 plus 11, that's 20. Minus 20 is 0. Well, wait a minute. If the function value is 0, that means that point is on the x-axis. That means it's an x-intercept. That means it's a 0 or root or solution. So what does that mean about 1? Is it a 0? It is. Okay. I still like doing it this way, though. I'm going to put a 1 in the box. And then we're going to write down a 1, an 8, an 11, and a negative 20. Now, we already know that this is going to work out, right? This is a 1. That's a 1. That's a 9. That's a 9. That's a 20. That's a 20. That's a 0. Okay? Everybody watching? What does that mean about the 1? Okay, what it means about the 1 is the 1's a 0. What factor does it correspond to? x minus 1. Okay, now take a good look. See this stuff that's left? Okay, we're actually going to talk about that. That's called the depressed polynomial. If this started out as x cubed, what does this need to start out as? x squared. So this is going to be x squared plus 9x plus 20. Okay, now take a good look at that. We already figured out that one works. So one of the ones in our list works. Take a look at what's left. This was a really ugly polynomial. Had four terms. It doesn't factor by grouping or anything like that. We've now pulled out a factor of x minus 1. We've divided by x minus 1. That's what the synthetic division did for us. And we've got this little depressed polynomial here. Take a good look at this depressed polynomial. x squared plus 9x plus 20. Doesn't that factor? Two numbers that multiply to be 20 that combine to be 9. 5 and 4. So this factors to x plus 5 and x plus 4. And that original factor of x minus 1. So if I take this polynomial here, I can rewrite it as x minus 1 x plus 5, x plus 4. Those are the factors. What are the zeros that come from each one of them? 1, negative 5, and negative 4. These are the zeros. So we pretty much know everything we need to know about this one. We know where it crosses the x-axis. Everybody listening? We know where it crosses the x-axis. We know what it looks like. It would look like x cubed, so it would start down here and end up here. Okay, And you can also look at it and you can figure out what the y-intercept is. The y-intercept would be negative 20. Would this be easy to graph now? A piece of cake, just like we learned in the last chapter. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, when you get done with a problem or you think you're done with a problem, go back and just read the instructions, make sure you did it correctly. 
Use the rational zeros theorem to find all the real zeros. How many were we looking for? Up to three. How many did we find? We, in fact, found all three of them. All three of them happened to be rash or real zeros. And then it says, factor it over the real numbers. Did we factor it? We factored it using real numbers. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, I do want to point this out. Notice that every one of these answers is in our list. One is in our list. Negative, whoops. Yeah, no. Uh, negative five is in our list and negative four is in our list. So of the 12 numbers we had there, the three answers we got were in our list. It has to work out that way, okay? If they're going to be nice, rational zeros. Okay, are there any questions? Okay. All right. So again, uh, just a quick word about depressed polynomial. That new polynomial that we get after we uh, divide out that factor is called a depressed polynomial because the degree is lower. Okay? Kind of got busted down there. It's a little bit sad. The depressed polynomial is easier to work with. So once you pull out a factor, it's going to be much easier to work with that depressed polynomial because the degree is smaller. Okay? All right. Any questions? Okay, we're going to do this one, and that's enough that you can, you can do nearly the entire assignment. We'll come back tomorrow. We'll finish this up. Um, but let's take a look at this problem right here. It says, solve the equation over the real number system. So let's take a look at this. How many answers could we possibly get to this? Okay. Look at the degree. Up to four real zeros. Okay. Now, notice it said we want to solve this. We want to find the solutions. Remember, solutions, roots, x-intercepts, zeros. Okay, same type of thing. Let's see. That's a mess. That has five terms. Could you factor that just using our factoring rules? Nope. So what are we going to start with? What ones are we going to try and find first? The ugly ones or the nice ones? The nice ones. We're looking for up to four real zeros. How do, what form are the nice ones in? What are we going to use here? P and Q. So start with the P and Q stuff. So P is going to be 8. Q is going to be 1. We love it when Q is 1 because our list is 1, 2, 4, 8. If you put those over 1, they don't change at all. We don't have any ugly fractions to deal with here, although these are still rational. We'll just put a plus or minus in front of each one of these. Okay? How many possible rational zeros do we have? Eight. Are they all going to work? No. Maybe only two of them work. Maybe only one of them works. Yeah. Um, what? Yeah, that is the list. That's the nice thing. When Q is 1, we love it when Q is 1 because that is just the list. We write down the factors of P, and there's our list. Put a plus, and plus or minus in front of it. Does that make sense? Okay. Happen, it worked the same way on this one here. Okay. Good? Okay. Uh, well, let's go through our list. Let's check and see if 1 works. Okay, now, this can get a little bit on the tedious side. If you want to plug in a 1, okay, again, you could just write down, if you plug in a 1, this is a 1. That's a minus 1. That's a 2. That's a minus 4. And that's a minus 8. Does that make a 0? Nope. Okay, so does, does positive 1 work? Nope. Okay, let's try negative 1. Okay, now, again, I like doing the synthetic division. So let's go ahead and do synthetic division with the negative 1. So this is going to be a 1, a negative 1, a 2, a negative 4, and a negative 8. Okay, and I would really recommend doing these in uh, pencil. Bring down, multiply, add. Multiply, add, multiply, Add, multiply. Okay. Everybody with me? Any questions to this point? Okay, don't say anything out loud. What does that mean about this number right here? Okay, there we go. What's the word again? 
Okay, that means this is a zero. That means the factor that it corresponds to would be x plus 1. Okay, so we've got one of the factors. Now I'm going to write this stuff down. What do we call this again? The depressed polynomial. So let's take a good look at the depressed polynomial. It was x to the fourth to begin with. We're going to start with x to the third, 2x squared, 4x minus 8. Okay, now just look at that for just a second. I'm going to enlarge this so we're just looking at this guy right here in a second. Are there any questions so far? How many answers are we looking for? Four. Up to four, okay? Would you take a good look at this? Especially this guy right here. How many terms? Four. four terms. Did we learn rules for factoring four terms? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see, if it had more than three terms, we had to use, what's it called, Zach? Grouping. We've got to use grouping. Could we group this? So instead of going back to our P's and Q's like this and figuring out what works here, could we look at this and say, well, gosh, maybe I can factor this. Do you notice anything about this first, the first two? You can pull out an x squared. What am I left with? An x minus 2. What can you pull out of the last two? Take out a positive 4. Please write the positive. You're left with x minus 2. So they both have an x minus 2, and we're left with an x squared plus 4. Okay, now don't forget this guy right here. Okay, what's the zero that comes from this one? Negative one. What's the zero that comes from this one? Two. Okay, aren't those both in our list? They're both in our list. Okay, now, what type of answers come from here? Okay, it's got two terms. It's got to either be a difference of squares, difference of cubes, or a sum of cubes. This is a plus, and it's not a cube. So does this factor? Not, not with real numbers, okay? You can't find any solutions to that that are real numbers, okay? So we'd be done factoring this. It's completely factored, and there are only two real zeros. Only two real zeros, negative 1 and 2. Any questions? Okay, you don't need to write this down, I just want you to watch. If we took x squared plus 4 to find the zeros of that, we'd move the 4 over, take the square root. What's the square root of negative 4? Plus or minus 2i. So one of them would be plus 2i, the other one would be minus 2i. Are those real numbers? No. So per the instructions, because it only wanted real numbers, do we include those as answers? Nope. We're done right here. Okay? Yeah. Would those be the actual other two answers? Okay, Shane, would you say that louder? Are those actually the other two answers? They are the other two answers. How many do we how many are we look are we looking for? Up to four real ones. How many are there in total once we throw in all the numbers, real numbers and imaginary? They're always going to be the same as the degree. And that's what we're going to cover in 5.4. Okay? All right. Any questions? Okay, that's enough that you can get started and do most of the assignment, if not maybe one or two problems. So go ahead and get started on it, and then we'll finish this up tomorrow. Have a great day.